Welcome, everybody. Um, everybody's here tonight because everybody has a, a love for figs or has a fig tree or wants to learn how to grow one. That's great. That's fantastic. Uh, I love that. I love teaching about it. Um, I love passing on what I know, how to turn a cutting into another tree so you can give them as gifts to friends and family and continue the, tr the tradition of um, growing a fig tree. It's very, very easy to do. To uh, propagate your own fig tree from a cutting. Very, very easy to do. And uh, I expect everybody to do it this year. Go home and do it and come out with fig trees in the spring and that'd be great. Immigration and naturalization of the fig tree to the United States. And it's a, a short lesson about the history and biology of the edible fig. And uh, so there is a, a difference you're gonna learn later between uh, the edible figs and non-edible figs, male trees, female trees, and no other plants have held such a sway over human imagination. imagination. They feature in every major religion and have influenced kings and queens, scientists and soldiers. They played roles in human evolu evolution and the dawn of civilization. These trees have not only witnessed history, they've shaped it. All right, my name is Danny Gentile and I'm 50 years old. Uh, I'm married. And I have two wonderful boys. That's Carmine, he's four years old, and Dominic is nine. So I'm a retired police officer. I did 21 years, and I'm a horticulturist, and I collect fig trees, and I have about 200 fig trees in my collection. And just an all around, I just love figs. So I'm not a biologist, and I'm not a botanist, and I have no formal agricultural education at all. Everything I learned was learned from family, other fig lovers, and that's it. So I grew up around it. I grew up around gardening, and uh, it just rubs off on you, and that's it. But I'm not doing anything that you can't do. Everything that I'm going to talk about, you can do. Um, so when it comes to rooting, it, uh, there's a difference between rooting and grafting. We're not grafting. Uh, although grafting is fantastic for fig trees, um, they're not the same thing. So anything I do, I, I'm going to talk about here, is something you could learn or you could do yourself. I got started uh, with fig trees. I guess uh, my earliest memory of fig trees is a little boy in the Bronx. I grew up in the Westchester Square section of the Bronx. Uh, very Italian neighborhood. Um, Everybody had a fig tree, including my great-grandfather, Pietro. Uh, he owned a few houses on the block, and uh, I was the youngest out of the bunch, out of all my cousins, and uh, I had to stay in the backyard. So I weren't allowed, if anybody grew up, Brooklyn, Bronx, and that, you know, you know, you're allowed out to the driveway first, and then, you know, you're allowed out to the sidewalk, but you can't go past that house and past that house. Then you're allowed out to the curbs, and little by little, so... Um, I grew up underneath my great-grandfather's fig tree, and um, I would spend the summers, well, my younger summers, uh, in the backyard with all the old ladies, everybody dressed in black, and just <laughs> bowls of figs. Just, it was just unbelievable. Uh, his fig tree, my neighbor's fig tree, everybody going, ah, oh, God, fiki, fiki, everybody, you know. Uh, so that, that's, those are my earliest memories of, of fig trees, and I guess, uh, it, just, it, it just never leaves you. I'm sure everybody in this room has a grandfather story. Everybody. I hear it all the time. Um, that's fantastic. That, that's wonderful. And you got to keep that, you got to hold that to your heart really close. I'm about 20 something years old and I get my first fig tree. And I go out and I visit these guys out in uh, Plainview, Long Island. And the name of the nursery is Belle Claire Nursery. So Belle Claire Nursery was famous for, um, what's her name, Martha Stewart did a show out there. She did a couple of shows out there, actually. And um, these guys were the world-renowned fig experts. They had co a collection from all over the world. These were the first guys to actually do it, to put it together, have a nursery that specialized in figs and have all these wonderful varieties. And I went out there and I bought a fig called Hardy Chicago. At the time, now Hardy Chicago is, eh, at the time, big fig Hardy Chicago. It was cold hardy and had all these traits that was wonderful for, for our area. 
and I spoke to the guy, Chris DePaolo over there. He was the owner, and he told me he spent an hour or more with me explaining how to grow this tree in a pot and uh, how to keep it healthy and really nice guy. I took it home and man, that thing, it grew from like this to like this. I was, oh my goodness, I put it in the garage at the end of the season and come the following spring, I thought it died. I, uh, the thing, it wasn't coming back to life. It was early April and I'm like, what the heck? And I felt so bad and I waited, waited, waited. I got nothing on it. I threw it out. I remembered that I wanted the original tree that I remember as a kid. That was the tree that was close to me and that was the, so that, that's all I wanted. So I went to uh, Google Earth, believe it or not, and I checked out the backyard, the old house on Silver Street, and I zoomed down, and sure enough, there it is. There's that canopy, that fig tree, man. I, you could, I could see it, I said, holy smoke, I couldn't believe it. That house was sold in 1980, and I haven't been there in pff, whatever. The neighborhood is not the greatest, but uh, got my wife, we went over there, and knocked on the door. The door cracked open this much. <laughs> the lady was, I mean, you know, it's the Bronx. But uh, I explained to her really quick what I wanted, who I was, and she said, opened up the door, she goes, oh, that fig tree gives us so many figs every year, and went on and on and on. Went in the back, I got some cuttings. Didn't work, they didn't work for me. So that was, I think it was 2012. I said, you know what? I still had the line of communication open with her. I went back there in 2013, and 2013 is when we got hit with that bad winter, 2013 and 2014. That tree, 80 years old at the time, with a trunk like this, huge canopy, died to the ground. So I couldn't get any material, and then the following year I did. Um, and I was explaining to someone in here that the tree started suckering sending up shoots from the, from the uh, earth straight up, really, really high. Not the best in material, but I cut it, I did it, I got it, and I finally got my great-grandfather's tree. So now I have it. Um, and that's the tree. I, I have 200 fig trees in my collection, and I have some trees that uh, come from uh, the rarest fig trees you could find that you could get that are just, the prices are outrageous for these trees and I could care less about any of them except my great-grandfather's tree. That's the only tree that I would, that means anything to me. So I, I always tell everybody that if you have the chance to, to get it, please do it. And if you want to talk to me about it afterwards, if you want to, you know, I could, I could help you. I've helped a lot of people get their trees back. Um, there's a couple of different methods you could use, believe it or not, is some detective work you could do and, uh, to get the tree back. Everything is growing in pots. So that picture that you saw there, that was all, everything is in pots. I took my last thing ground one out last year. And uh, it's just taken up for over here. For, I've, I've just learned that pots is it. <laughs> they, they grow just as good as, they grow better in the ground, obviously. But for us, you can't beat a pot. So from that, my great-grandfather's tree, that's when I got into collecting. I never knew there was this whole uh, culture of collecting fig trees and it, it's crazy when you get involved in it. It's very addicting. Um, I guess there's worse things in life, but uh, the, you know, the, the benefits you get from it, the time you get to spend with your family, and the, the fruit you get to enjoy, and you learn how to cook, and you meet new people, and you, it, it goes on and on and on. Um, so it's a really wonderful experience, and I guess that's the, the whole thing about uh, collecting fig trees. So why am I doing this? So, I want to get more people involved, as many people as I can, into growing fig trees. Um, and we need more conservators of these rare varieties. So those varieties I was telling you about, your great-grandfather's variety, whoever's, you know, that, that, there, there's no other connection anywhere else besides that one tree. You got to spread that. You got to spread the love. You got to, you know, give it out to family members, and that's got to keep going. It's a living legacy. Keep it going. Uh, connection to the past that, it, that those varieties of trees just don't exist anymore. They're just not around except in the spots that where our ancestors brought them to here, to, to our, our location. Help start breeding programs to create uh, new varieties. 
uh, evaluate varieties for quality and climate. That's big for us over here. I'm constantly doing that. The, anything that'll live for us over here in, the, in our cold climate, that's great. Uh, create small repositories, and these are actually living libraries of uh, these rare varieties. So, you know, I, I have my own collection of 200 trees. You'll have one, you'll have one, you'll have one. That's some network of trees, if they're ever needed, if someone's ever got to come back to get a variety. Or, it, it really is. And I, I have a network, if somebody tells me right now, I got, well, I got my great grandfather's in South Dakota, and I, I'm telling you, I could have somebody in front of that house in 15 minutes looking for a fig tree. There's that many fig nuts out there, and that widespread. So what is a fig tree? Um, there are about 850 different kinds of fig trees. Um, they're all in the mulberry family. Most of them are evergreens. And some of these examples that you might be familiar with, uh, uh, ficus carica, that's what we eat, that's the edible fig. Then there's benjamina, it's a common house plant, pumila, and that's the vine you see that attached to the sides of buildings. Um, microcarpa is trained for bonsai, so you, you've definitely seen them around. Uh, Bengalens Bengalensis is a strangler uh, fig tree. We don't have those over here. Uh, it's a tropical tree, and um, there's a lot of, I, I added that because there's a lot of religious significance with uh, that fig tree. Um, Afghas Afghanistanica, beautiful tree, no fruit. Some of them do have, may have fruit, but it's a beautiful, beautiful tree. Afghanistanica, if you ever get a chance to get one, add it, very easy to grow and keep alive. And palmata, so I gave this one a separate slide. Uh, it's also known as the Punjab fig, and it grows wild in the Himalayas. Uh, and that's important because it's a cold region. It's important for us because this is a cousin of Carica, which is the fig we eat from. So um, we could graft, uh, we could breed with this, this variety, Carica could breed with Palmata, and we could also use this as rootstock for, for uh, grafting and just come up with, the, well, you're not gonna come up with a new variety by grafting, but um, as far as putting it in the ground and giving a variety that might not otherwise give us fruit because uh, it, needs a longer season, man, we can get it to ripen with that rootstock. So that, that's why that, that's important. So if you ever, ever see anything in a nursery, in a store, anybody talking about a cross between a palmata, just know that it's a good fig. So we're concerned basically uh, mainly with the edible fig and it's botanically identified as ficus, ficus carica. It's known as the common fig or just the fig. Um, it's a deciduous plant, deciduous plant. That means it uh, loses its leaves uh, every year. Um, it has, uh, the leaves are very large, uh, lush, and fragrant. So if you've ever noticed, they smell, a lot of people say they smell like cat pee. Um, I, don't, I don't agree. Uh, I, I, I love the smell of, of fresh pee. I walk through my backyard, I can just smell that all day long. It's, it's fantastic. But they are very fragrant. They do uh, effervesce a, <laughs> a, a, a fragrance, and it, it's, it is very noticeable. They have smooth gray bark, and they produce one or two cr crops. Some varieties only produce one, uh, but most will produce two crops of fruit. Leaves drop in the fall. They grow from 30, uh, three to over 30 feet tall. So uh, most people say, ah, 30 feet, and, but uh, these people out in, in California, I tell them about these trees in Brooklyn that grow three, four stories tall. I mean, I've, I've heard, I've never witnessed it, but I've heard stories about uh, people taking the top of a fig tree in for the winter and wrapping the rest. And they have figs or whatever in, in the house. I've heard the stories. I've never seen it, but those are some pretty big trees. Those are some pretty big fig trees. And they're still, they're still around, too. So there are uh, many different types from slow-growing dwarf fig trees, small leaves, small figs. They'll stay compact. Great for a pot, put on a patio, backyard, wherever. And then there's other ones that are just monstrous, like that palmata. Um, there's a couple of palmata varieties, palmata crosses that just, you just, you can't stop them from growing. You chop it down to this, next year it'll be up here. It's amazing. And the fruits are just, I think I have a picture on one of the slides over there. So the biggest, I'll just throw this in, the biggest fig I grew in my life, I weigh every, every variety, um, 205 grams for a, a fig that came off of a palmata cross, it's called yellow long neck. 
That's about, that's about that big. Massive, massive. It's a meal. If you're eating, that's a meal. All right, so they could live for uh, 100 years or more, and I have heard of uh, certain fig trees living actually hundreds of years. Uh, you could be, fig trees could be left alone to grow like a bush. So this is no pruning, nothing, it just keeps growing. Or um, I'm going to say that that one's out somewhere really, you know, maybe out, out west or down south somewhere. And this is something that we could expect here. If we left it, our fig tree to grow like a bush, it would look something like that. Um, or it can be trained like a tree. Central leader, nice canopy. It, it depends on where you want it. This is, this is an, a very nice structure. Um, beautiful structure, it, it's like a vase. It opens up, the center is all open, the sunlight gets in there. I, if I'm looking at these two trees, I'm gonna say that this one gives you more fruit than that one. Um, but they're both beautiful, that's how I, I try to grow all my trees. Sometimes you can't get them, they just don't wanna grow like a bush or like a tree. And it's, you can't have everything, but you try. I try to grow everything, central leader, with a, with a nice canopy. If anybody is not familiar with the sap of a fig tree, um, all parts of a fig tree contain sap, everything. Uh, it's an irritant to, to some people. Some people will, will never feel it. I get it bad. And it's not an allergy to the sap unless you're allergic to latex. So if you have an allergy to latex, there is a possibility you'll be allergic to fig trees. What it is, is it's um, a, uh, a condition, and it's often confused with uh, an allergy or poison ivy, it's called pho uh, phytophotodermatitis. And what it is, it's a reaction with the fig sap to the sun. And uh, I think uh, lime will give you the same thing, and I don't know if it's rhubarb or celery. There's a couple of different things. I've heard of a, a margarita burn. That's people who drink uh, margaritas and the, the limes in them, and it'll, it'll, it, it um, drips down on the chest. They go lay out in the sun, boom, they get a bad, really bad burn over here. Um, so I, I know that that exists, but that's what it is. It's uh, phytophotodermatitis. It affects people, uh, all people differently. Like I said, I get it bad. So by the end of the summer, I'm just like, I. I, you know, it's 95 degrees out and I'm just covered head to toe with, I just, you know, I have a sweatshirt on, gloves on, and I, I got to walk through the figs like that. I have no choice, otherwise I'm going to suffer. Um, but again, it doesn't affect everybody and I got 200 fig trees, so it's, you know, <laughs> it's a lot more than, than just having, you know, if you have one fig tree, don't worry about it, or a couple. So the fruit of a fig tree is actually an inverted flower. So now we're going to get into the fun stuff. Um, the casing we eat, it's called a syconium, and it contains thousands of tiny flowers uh, that bloom on the inside. Um, syconium contains flowers and seeds, and uh, each one has an osteole, which is the eye of the fig, that's the hole in the bottom of the fig, and that's there for pollination. So we can't pollinate or have figs pollinated in our neck of the woods. Uh, I know people that have tried, you can't do it. It's almost, it's impossible. So um, that hole there is, I guess, um, for us, an intrusion for, it could be for other insects sometimes, I have heard of that, larger holes. So if you're looking for a variety of fig, don't try not to get one with a really large eye, get one with a small eye. Um, otherwise the eye is, for us, is kind of meaningless. Depending on who you talk to, there's different accounts of where fig trees come from and it's, Anywhere from Italy, the Middle East, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Northern Asian, um, Asia Minor, I think that's on top of Turkey, and uh, Africa. Um, so what we do know is the domestic, domestic fig tree, not the wild fig tree, the domestic fig tree is ancient. Um, and that's because the symbolism of a fig tree is referenced in many religious texts. Actually, all religious texts. Uh, mention a fig tree. So that makes it thousands of years old. Um, so that's Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, and Buddhism. There is archaeological evidence. If you can believe it, these people dig up uh, uh, petrified figs. Um, and they, there is a find, one in particular, but there are other finds dating back to 11,000 years ago. Cyprus, Syria, Iraq, Israel, Jordan, and Jericho in the West Bank. I think I have pictures of the one from Jericho. 
And uh, that provides evidence that a fig was the first agricultural crop. That's before grain. If you could think about that, that's before bread, before all that, the fig. People were, were making these fig trees and uh, planting them out in fields maybe. Uh, so here's the fig remains that were found in the site in, uh, in Jordan. And uh, so after a study, they, it was revealed that these were growing on a tree that isn't pollinated by insects and won't reproduce unless someone takes a plant and cutting uh, and, and uh, cutting and plants it. Now that's very important. So they, I'm sure they opened up these things, they took the seeds out and they could tell by looking at the seed um, if it was pollinated. If that was not pollinated and you're holding a fig, well, that means someone like us had to do it. You had to take a cutting like that, stick it in the ground, nurture it, grow it, and there you go. These areas in the light brown here, this, is, this map is a really good depiction of where, uh, I'm sorry, the native range for figs. So when I say native range, I mean that's where they are um, pollinated. So that's, you can grow a fig anywhere in the world, anywhere. But that's where they grow, that's where they occur naturally, in, in those areas. So uh, outside of the native range, uh, figs were introduced and naturalized into other parts of the world. So that's other parts that have a, uh, a Mediterranean climate. So here's where they come from, the Mediterranean basin. California is, believe it or not, it's uh, naturalized. They have the fig wasp over there. They actually grow wild figs out in California. But they were introduced. It was naturalized over there. Same thing with over here with uh, Chile. Um, and down in southern, uh, in South Africa, and Western and South Australia, um, all have uh, naturalized figs. And uh, from those areas outside of naturalization, uh, fig trees were introduced and maintained everywhere else. So that's pretty much everywhere. You can grow a fig tree everywhere. Um, you know, the, it, I guess the the um, the gist of it is: is do you grow it in ground? Do you grow it in a pot? Do you, uh, you can pretty much grow a fig tree anywhere. Today we know that fig trees will grow in ground uh, in the U.S. without winter protection in USDA zone 8 and above. We're in 7A. So that means, I don't care what anybody tells you, how cold hardy a fig tree is, if you want your tree to survive, you got to wrap it, you got to protect it. You have to. In our zone, you have to protect it. If you get away with it all these years, and my great-grandfather's tree is the case in point, it lived like that for 80 years until I came across it again, and the following year it died to the ground. So you're rolling the dice. Every, every single year you're rolling the dice. So zone uh, 8 and above, so here's, zone, here's uh, zone 7. Is that green? Believe it or not, right here, right over here, we catch a 7B. So where other places may freeze around us here, still stays pretty warm. So I'm right by the water over there. I'm right in that 7B and my fig trees love it. They enjoy it, really enjoy it over there. Um, but you can see that 7 is, is pretty wide. It goes way up into Pennsylvania and look how far it goes up here, up by uh, uh, Michigan. It really is a big zone. Imagine growing figs all the way up there. You'd say, oh my goodness, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it, but they do. All right, so how did figs get to North America? And uh, in prehistoric times, uh, certain extinct species grew wild everywhere. And um, we know this because there were 70 million year old petrified figs found in the badlands of eastern Montana in Dawson County. These are not the figs that we know today. Um, probably a distant cousin, not, not even close, a very, very distant cousin. Um, so this is what it looked like 70 million years ago, and I can't believe that I found this map, but you can see that water going, look at that, going up there. We weren't even, we were still underwater over here. Most of the western United States were still under Florida, and right there is where they found it. So that just proves how important the fig tree is to, uh, in, in nature, in the cycle um, of life in any ecosystem any forest, any rainforest, and anyway, it is so uh, valuable. They named this 
called uh, this variety, it was Ficus ceratops. Goes back to the late Cretaceous period. First uh, documented account of figs coming to the United States was by Spanish Franciscan missionaries. Uh, came here in 1520, set up missions, and gave us the mission fig. So they came here, grew these out in the fields, taught uh, natives and everyone else how to grow them, and this was a staple food for them out in uh, California. Christopher Columbus, he established a route to America in 1492. So Chris was born in Genoa, Italy. That's like ground zero for figs. Um, lived in Portugal, another ground zero for figs. And Spain, oh my goodness. Spain has some of the best figs on the earth. He married a, uh, into a Portuguese, a noble, port, very important, a noble Portuguese family. Uh, so again, some of the best figs and who was involved in the discovery of the Madeira Islands. Very important when it comes to Christopher Columbus because one of the best varieties of fig that we have today is called the Black Madeira. Comes from the Madeira Islands. Very, very rare. It's hard to grow, but when we could get it to grow up here, oh my goodness, it is unbelievable. One of the best figs, if not the best fig on the face of this earth. I'm gonna say that there's no doubt in his provisionings in 1492, he had figs on that, on that boat, on one, of the, on one of those boats, or maybe all of them, definitely. He never made it to America proper, but I, I, guess, I think he landed in the Bahamas um, and Central America after that. He made another trip. But uh, yeah, I'm going to say absolutely, he, he had figs on that. And, and the same goes with these guys. So Spanish explorers um, hit St. Augustine, Florida, 1565. Um, the British, maybe not. French, definitely, in Quebec. Canada, huge fig place, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, and a real heavy influence of French figs in Canada. Uh, Thomas Jefferson introduced a lot of varieties of figs into Virginia. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was a fig maniac. Uh, he grew a lot of other fruits, but um, in uh, Monticello in Virginia, he created a microclimate for growing specifically Fig. So here are, his fig, here are the fig trees, and this was recreated. This is his submural planting right here, and what it does is it radiates heat. Uh, he's taking advantage, there's big mountains behind him, and he takes advantage of the, uh, the warm air that comes down at night, combined with, this is a southern exposure, that heats up that wall, and it lays all that heat at night into that orchard. It's really, it's really a genius way of growing. So the European immigration, now I got 1880 to 1965. It's probably 1880 to like 1920 or so. So this is the period of time that most fig trees we're familiar with came to the United States. These fig trees sailed with our grandparents and great grandparents to this new land. They were nurtured and protected through methods taught by their own parents. And they provided healthy, delicious fruit with a strong connection to home. The care and maintenance that was afforded to any fig tree became symbolic of the struggle, growth, and development of their own families in the United States. And that bond was passed on to their children and grandchildren and should continue to be protected today. So these are the trees that we are familiar with here and the ones that we're concerned with. In my opinion, these are the best varieties of fig that are available anywhere today. And the reason is, when your grandfather and your grandfather and your grandfather and grandmother and they came to this country, they were not taking the worst fig tree with them. They were taking the best. They're over there and eating figs, just bit walking to wherever, the neighbors are picking figs as they're walking. They know, already know, where the best fig trees are back in the old country. They've been there for eons. So when they're coming here and they're taking a tree, a cutting, a small rooted tree, whatever they're bringing here, they are absolutely bringing the best. And that's why I have to say, I've come across dozens of uh, fig trees that are first generation to the United States that are fantastic. They uh, really, you just cannot get these varieties anymore. You can't. Um, so that, those are very, very important to us. And that's why, again, if I, I tell you, if you, it's even a small possibility you can get the tree you had or your grandparents had when, uh, uh, when you were a kid, get it. Try and get it. If you need some help, I'll, I'll help you out. But we do not have a fig wasp here. 
So if you've ever seen you know, any articles, anything online, there's a lot of misconceptions, a lot. Pictures of wasps and, you know, are you eating this? And the big eh, bzz, ugly face and no. There are no bugs in our figs over here. It, it's impossible, we can't support the colony. I wish we could, I wish we could because our figs would be really outrageous. So when they're pollinated, the result is um, a better fig. So you could take a fig, uh, a hardy Chicago, and that, that I'm just saying that one because it's probably one you could get commercially in a store. Um, dark sack, cut it open, red interior. Uh, the ones in the store are not so juicy, but you still, they're, they're okay. Pollinate that fig, and it's the sweetest piece of fruit you'll ever eat in your life. Uh, the different uh, flavors that appear after, after pollination, they run from uh, melon to apple to cherry to, uh, the list goes on and on. It, it's really a pollinated fig, really is delicious. We can't have them here, so I, I, I don't get into it too much. I make a trip out west every year um, just to eat them, but we still have some of the finest figs right here in the northeast, and I mean the finest. And so I have a, a, an old farmhouse upstate, and uh, I put them in a trailer, drive them up three hours, put them in the basement, 50 degrees all winter, and then uh, take them out in the spring. Again, the details and biology of uh, ficus carica are long and complicated, so I'm not going to get into much of it here, only where it's important to us uh, growing figs here in the Northeast. Um, but the life cycle of the fig relies on a tiny, tiny insect called Blastophaga senis, or the fig wasp. Uh, they get a lot, I already told you this, they get a lot of bad press because some misinformed authors will write articles you know, with pictures of big yellow jackets on them and has nothing to do with a fig. Um, that's not the wasp that sustains the life cycle of uh, the fig tree. But there's the, that's what you'll see when you start looking up these articles online. And uh, has the farthest of anything, that's not going anywhere inside of a fig. This is Blastophaga senis. So that's the head of a, the eye of a pin. That's the head of a pin. Uh, so they're about one and three quarter millimeter, maybe two millimeters long. And here's a picture that I took in uh, this past year in, uh, in Orchard in, out in California. So that fig's about that big. If you get an idea, that's how big the wasp is. That's the pollinator. Their sole purpose in life is to create more fig wasps and pollinate trees and fig trees. And that's it. That's their entire existence. And every species of fig trees, so there's 850 species, virtually every one has its own pollinator. Um, they occur naturally in areas around the Mediterranean and other areas where it was introduced and able to colonize. So that's those areas again with the Mediterranean climate. So they'll, they'll have uh, pollinator wasps over there. They'll, they're able to support, those climates are able to support the wasps. You can buy dried figs in the store. Are there wasps in there? Maybe. Maybe, but they're not, when a, when a wasp goes inside of a fig, um, by the time that fig, it's, it's months before the fig is ready, and by the time the fig is ready to, be, uh, to pick and eat, there's a chemical in there that naturally disintegrates it, and it just makes it part of the fig, and that's it, so it's gone. The figs we propagate are common, unpollinated, parthenocarpic cultivars with the persistent gene and must be pros propagated by cuttings, air layers, or grafting. Now I know it's a lot, and I'm not even going to get into what, what it means. It, it does get very complicated, but that's the official explanation of why we don't have um, wasps over here. There are male, male and female fig trees, uh, and there's a symbiotic relationship that exists between um, fig wasps and the trees. Um, the, the figs pollinate the trees, make more fruit, which make more wasps and so on and so forth, the cycle goes on. It's male and female trees, and a, a male capra fig, it exists only for pollination. That's it. it can, it'll have three crops. If any of those three crops don't make it, um, every one of those three crops has to live in order for the cycle to persist. So if that last one, that mame crop, 
dies, which we can grow a male caprifig here, we'll get profici, and we'll get a mamoni, that mammae crop, dead. That's it, you just killed it. You just broke the cycle, and it won't come back. So that's, that's another reason why we won't have it. The female tree is what we're concerned with. We have uh, the first crop, it's called the breba. We get that in the summer, and the second crop we get in the late, uh, late summer and fall. Um, that's the main crop. So the, the trees that we are concerned with here are these two right here, a San Pedro, this one more common. It's persistent, it's got a persistent gene, and uh, that just means that it's a, it's a, a common fig and does not need to be pollinated to reproduce. We have to uh, reproduce it by cuttings. And uh, San Pedro does have a first crop that is parthenocarpic. And that's important to us because there are some varieties of San Pedro type figs that are great for our area only because that's an early, early crop. And that can give us here figs June-ish. I'm going to say June-ish. So that's great. There are some varieties. Uh, Desert King comes to mind as one of them. Um, it'll give you the first crop, second crop. It'll just it'll form and fall to the ground because it, it's, it's not pollinated. But otherwise, this is where we live, right here. And there are tons and tons and tons of varieties. Fig wasp mate over winter in inedible figs of the male fig trees, and uh, those males are pollinators only. So the male fig wasps come out of the figs of the male fig tree and they die. Their sole purpose is to mate, drill a hole in the fig, capper fig, an inedible fig, so the other wasps can come out. The females come out covered with pollinated, pollen, search for other figs to, uh, to, to crawl into, and so goes the cycle. If anybody thinks that you can grow a, a fig from a seed, the answer is most of the time no. Sometimes you can. Um, I'm not going to get into this too much, but uh, you need the right uh, mix of combination to come together to actually get viable seeds. Um, so the seeds that we're eating in our common figs, you cannot grow a fig tree from. They're not pollinated. Um, if you want to give it a shot, just to try it, get some dried figs, wash the seeds off, and you can plant them out and they'll grow just fine. They'll grow, you'll have a million little fig trees. Not one of them is going to grow a fig. Most of these farms, that they, uh, they, they grow it in a certain way that the seeds that result inside those uh, figs will not produce another edible fig. So that means that the trees that we grow here, you, if you planted out the seeds, almost one in a million shot that you'll get a, a, an edible fig. So the, uh, the ratio of seeds from pollinated varieties, varieties that'll produce a tree similar to the parent is about one in a thousand. Uh, to produce one that's better than the parent, which is the whole object of breeding, is one in 20,000. Collect and clean the seeds, you've got to separate the viable ones from the inviable ones by just floating them in water. So after you clean them, just get like a little Tupperware filled with water, lay the seeds on top, and the ones that sink are the good ones. Everything else just throw away. So the ones that sink were, were, are the ones that were pollinated. Uh, any talk about variety should always be prefaced by an uh, explanation of fig naming conventions. This can get a little boring, um, but um, it's always been an issue, uh, fig naming. And the main reason is that great varieties of figs are constantly rediscovered. So my great-grandfather would bring over a fig, and I don't know the name of it. It doesn't have a name. It's just fig. It's, you know... I call my great-grandfather's Fuller Street. That's the house where we lived. That's where we grew up. So I call it Fuller Street. A neighbor may take a, you know, take a cutting, grow it out, great fig, and call it, uh, I don't know, Joe's fig. Someone, he'll give it to somebody, that person will lose the tag and give it to somebody else that'll name it uh, Kathy's fig. The different naming conventions, a lot of them have become the norm. A lot of them. And it's just in when you... In, in fig circles, you'll know that a uh, black Madeira, Madeira that I mentioned before is a great fig. But if you can believe it, there's an even better one called a black Madeira KK. So there's all these different little nuances and different, so 
it, it does get a little crazy uh, with the naming. Uh, if you're worried about just eating figs, don't worry about the naming. Just if you want to get into it that far, you can. Just get some fig trees and, and eat some fruit and that's it. So intentionally mislabeled figs. So now the bad guys see this is what's going on. It's really genius that they caught on to this and they don't know anything about figs and they will take a cutting like this and sell it to any one of you guys who have seen a black Madeira and you'll get this in the mail and you'll say, oh, black Madeira, you plant it and it'll grow and it'll take you about four years before you realize it's not. It's just any run of the mill fig. But yet you paid about, you know, 100 bucks for that one piece of wood. Um, so that's why uh, FigBid exists. That's why I, I created it. So my background is in law enforcement, and I saw this was going on. Everybody in the hobby complained about it, and uh, I just filled a, uh, a spot that needed filling, and that's it. So uh, it does really well. I don't vet every single seller, but I make sure there's no chicanery that goes on, and everything works out pretty good. The only fig that really should come in with a new name is a seedling. So let's say you do get that one in a million and it grows and that's the only one that should really have a new name because it never existed before. If you get a, free, a, a fig tree from a seedling, a fig from a seedling, that tree should have a name. Absolutely. Because it just doesn't exist. And there are breeding programs that are constantly doing that uh, today. I'll get into the best, the worst, and then uh, everything else. So the best fig tree, I've said it, is the one that you grew up with. If you can get it, that's the best fig. Um, there's just no, I, I really can't explain to you how, how it feels to get that tree and grow it. A piece of, uh, have a piece of your legacy, uh, that heirloom. It, it really is a great feeling. But if it's a tree you, you know, planted five years ago, you got from a nursery, and they said it was going to be this and that, and it turned out to be Zippo, get rid of it. I've done it. Put it to the curb. Get a new fig tree. So the second best is uh, any variety you could find that's close to your house. So if you know, have a neighbor that brags about figs or have a neighbor that knows another neighbor that, hey, he's got a fig tree, um, get cuttings of it. Because that fig, if he's eating off that tree, that's a good tree for you. So you, you already know it produces fruit. You know, you're going to know how to do it in a little while, how to make a duplicate. Get it. Just get it. These are your staple varieties. So if you just want to start a collection, you want to have a couple of different varieties, different tastes, textures, sizes, colors. Celeste, brown turkey. A lot of people are down on brown turkey. I love brown turkey. Great fig. Uh, Dominic's fig, introduced by a guy in uh, New Jersey. Fantastic fig for us over here. Uh, Gino's fig is another one. Part of Chicago, there it is. Sweet Diana, so this is one that I introduced. I introduced Sweet Diana. Um, Desert King is the one I told you about. It's one crop, early crop, great for us over here, and greenish gear. So these are my selections. Other fig guys may look at this and say, well, why'd you pick uh, Dominic? So why, you know, this is what I picked. This is what I, I grow these. These are my staple. These are my workhorses, these trees. I walk by them and I pick them off them and eat off them all summer long. And, they produce from Celeste down to Greenish Gear, all from early summer out into the fall. I'm eating from every one of these trees. Here's your intermediate uh, varieties. And I guess by intermediate, I could say it's uh, a step into collecting fig trees. And uh, they'll cost you a little bit of money. Definitely won't break the bank. Any one of these could be had for about 20 bucks. Um, Adriatic. Uh, JH is the, is the initial stands, the initials of the guy that introduced it. The guy's name is Joe Hood, uh, old time grower. I don't even know if he's still involved anymore, but introduced that variety. Uh, Stella, uh, I, I don't, you really can't tell, but that's a quarter. And uh, those figs get like this and just blood red inside. You could take a butter knife and scoop out that interior and just put it on some toast. It is, it's fantastic. Smith is arguably one of the best. I'm going to say arguably because I said Black Madeira is the best, but arguably one of the best for us. It's, it's just the taste. It's so different. Um, it's not the best looking fig, but it's very productive and delicious. Um, Nero 600M, I, I, I spoke to you about that. So that's from the, the area where, where your family is from. Ronde de Bordeaux, everybody should have this tree. 
This should be everybody's first tree, Ronda de Bordeaux. Figs are like that big. The tree is very prolific and just grows. It would, would not any, uh, much hassle at all. Anything in this list can cost 500, 200, 100. The prices are date all over the map, and, but um, I'm a fig guy, and to me, they're worth it. They, if, when you eat these, it's just like uh, anything you've, nothing like you've eaten before. Once a fig is picked, it doesn't ripen. So if you pick an unripe fig, throw it in the garbage, unless you have something else to do with it. It, it will not ripen. Uh, they have to ripen on the tree, and they got to be picked at the right time. Um, and it's not complicated. I'm sorry if that comes across like it's complicated. It's not. Very easy to do. So a fig needs 90 to 100 days from the time you see that little embryo on the, in the crotch of the, uh, between the leaf and the, and the stem to the time you're eating it, 90 to 100 days. A fig will start to swell during the first stage of ripening. That's what happens. It, just, it starts to blow up a little bit. That's the first sign, and you'll notice the change right away. And um, from that point, it could take anywhere from hours or months to ripen, and it's variety dependent. So I've gone, I've gone in the yard and I've looked at a fig that, oh, look at that, it just blew up today. I'll come back five o'clock that night, it's on a hot summer day, man, that fig is drooped, ready to go. It's unbelievable. I've also, varieties that, like those called the doms that were up there, will not. They'll blow up and they'll stay like that for months and never ripen. When you pick a fig, it should not produce any sap. So I'm not going to get into this whole long list here of everything. If you pull that off or you cut it, the best is to do is to get a little pair of snippers and separate it with that. And a little bit of sap comes out, you picked it too soon. There should be no sap. Skin gets wrinkled. It'll start to stretch like, almost like there's a pinball inside. Some of them develop those longitudinal cracks where the white pith below uh, shows it's, it's very, to me, I, that makes a great picture of a fig. I love seeing that. Um, but they're there to help uh, the fig so it won't split. So the skin will split in those areas and that's it. The fig won't split open and expose the flesh to the outside. There's a Maltese falcon. And you can see some of the, the, uh, the drops, the, the honey comes out of these cracks over here. Even comes out. But you can see how they, they look heavy and they're, they're soft. Some of them get this ooze of uh, honey at the eye. Over here, this is Corinth. Um, this is not a real indicator that it's ready. A lot of people say, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's crying, it's ready. And it's not, it's not a real indicator. It'll get soft as well. So it's got to it's got to have give give in it, um, and uh, some varieties are not you're not going to get to hang like this will never hang low. There's no neck on that. They grow in just bunches at the end of a branch, so th that fig will never um, will, will hang never hang like this one or that one. That that picture is a little off kilter. The problem with it is this is that you you got to fight the birds. So birds know when a fig is like this. They just know, it's amazing. They won't go near any, you know, they won't go near this, but they'll go right, oh, look at this, boom. They peck right at it, stallings are the worst. Oh, forget it. But you gotta fight the birds, that's it. So taste is very subjective, but uh, there are three main tastes that a fig will have, and that's uh, berry, sugar, and honey, and everything in between. Some of the tastes are, they really uh, can be differ because of soil, fertilizer, uh, climate, watering schedule, and uh, all of those play a, a big role in what the, the taste of a good fig can be. Uh, mountainfigs.net, uh, really, he's really, really into taste. Uh, taste, texture, color, and he came up with this chart, and this is one of the best that I've, I've ever seen out of any even books that I, I've read. And, um, he correlates the colors with the taste, and um, starting from uh, light berry figs, they go from red to blush to gold to yellow. And these, when you pick up a red fig, most of the time, you're going to get a citric berry flavor out of it, most of the time. Um, when you start coming into the honey berry, you pick up 
that red fig, you're gonna get a, a tannin berry flavor. And just to get into those, uh, a tannin has, adds uh, bitterness and astring astringency. I tell you, the chart just works all the way around. It doesn't work 100%. But if you, could, if you visit, if you're really interested in flavor, uh, you start developing your own flavor for figs, um, this, is, you, this is a PDF on his website. You could download it and print it out. I have several. I have one in my yard, in my shed, on my desk, and I, I refer to it constantly. It's really a, a great chart. And I think Tony uses uh, strawberry as his base, a strawberry flavor. But the, the berry flavors go from raspberry, blackberry, cranberry, uh, uh, all the way up to grape. And apple, melon. Melon's a big fig flavor, melon. Uh, citrus, plum, peach, and cherry. Not too many figs have cherry flavor. I have one or two that have a cherry flavor. Outstanding, outstanding varieties. And then the other non-fruity flavors are uh, caramel, vanilla, maple, nuts. A lot of figs have a nutty flavor in them. And uh, molasses. All right, so the health benefits. Raw figs, this is 100 grams of figs, 74 calories. That's not too bad. That's like three figs, three medium-sized figs. Three grams of dietary fiber, 16 grams of sugar. I mean, I, I could live with that. But look at it versus 100 grams of dried figs, 249 calories, Oof. but 48 grams of sugar, 10 grams of fiber. But the health benefits of dried versus fresh are compounded immensely. So here's 100 grams of raw figs. So we'll, just go, we'll go with the top three, potassium, manganese, and vitamin K, 7%, 6%, and 6% of the daily value of, um, our, uh, of what we're supposed to have. And here's 100 grams of dried. 26% of your daily value for manganese. This is just 100 grams of dried figs. Vitamin K, 19%. Um, if anybody's taking um, blood thinners, I believe it is, you gotta watch out, because I think vitamin K is a blood thickener, and you gotta talk to your doctor about eating figs. And health benefits, the figs, real boost to the immunity system. I could say 100% from before, I was a fig collector to now, my goodness, I, I, I don't want to say I rarely get sick, and I knock on some wood, but man, I got to say, eating figs, really good for you. Insulin control, good for the heart, a lot of good benefits for the skin, eating them and also using them as um, w mixed with other products like yogurt and stuff like that for, to make facial masks, and they're great for the hair, um, really, really great for the hair. Good for eye health. They're great for the bones, of course, digestion. Everybody knows this. Figs are famous for that, for fiber. Laxative to some, not everybody. The, the myths are, I mean, uh, abound. Good for weight loss, excellent for weight loss. Make you feel f uh, fuller. A lot of research uh, for cancer prevention. I think uh, there's another study, a newer study, it's 2016 it was concluded about um, uh, breast cancer and, and uh, figs. And, uh, Great for controlling blood pressure. So here we go, caring for your fig tree. So this is something that somebody said to me once. Grandpa used to sit in the yard enjoying his denobles with a glass of wine. When he was finished, he'd throw the cigar butt at the fig tree. And I swear to you, this is what a guy came to me <laughs> and said one time. And what he was doing, his grandfather was doing, was fertilizing his fig tree with those cigar butts. That was that guy's fertilizer. So this is why I don't get, really get into fertilizer. It, it's very personable to everybody, even me, of what should be done. I mean, I've heard everything. Matchstick heads, uh, uh, fish heads. Uh, uh, it's, it, you can only imagine. But you want to know something? If that's what worked for your grandfather, who the heck am I to say, don't do that. Go use miracle Grow or you got to do what you want to do, what makes you happy, and that's it. miracle Grow. I know a lot of people are down on it, um, but the reason why I use it is because it's accessible. It's easily accessible, and when I need fertilizer, I need to run into the store, get it. I need it now. I know how much to use. For, I know my dose, and that's it. That, that's all I want. Um, I do also use that said Alaska fish fertilizer is now getting more popular. It's a little easy to get. So I used to, used to use it as secondary and I'm kind of now making it a, pro, uh, 
with my pro putting it in, working it into my primary fertilizing schedule. Fig trees, take them out. I do my root pruning. Um, I'm sorry, this is after root pruning. So we're taking them out now for the spring. I put a controlled release fertilizer. Again, it's either going to be a miracle Grow or an Osmocote. And it's, that's the controlled release fertilizer, those little balls. So that's it. I'll put four times the dose, sprinkle it on the top of the pot. I'll do that again in the middle of the season. All right? That's the first thing I do. Every tree gets that. When I repot, when I up pot, it always gets a, controlled, a dose of controlled release fertilizer. Once a week, I do miracle Grow, and I'll stay by the directions on the container. Um, and in the miracle Grow, I'll add a product called Super Thrive, just micronutrients, Alaska, Alaskan fish fertilizer. So I'll do that maybe once a month. I'll throw that in the schedule as well. If you're growing in a pot, you have to feed them. You have to. They'll grow figs. They may not be as big, you may not get as many. To really make the tree realize its own potential, you have to feed it. You have to. So I use the combination of fish and seaweed, that one. That's just my preference. My tree's got to tell me, I don't care what percentages somebody thinks my tree should have, it matters what my tree tells me. I'm very sensitive to a leaf droop or a leaf drop or it just doesn't look right and I know it's because of what I'm giving it to eat. In-ground fig trees, full sun, at least six to eight hours when you're putting it in the ground, all right? Um, dig the hole, double the size of the root ball, and put a mixture of garden and potting soil in the bottom of the hole, put the fig tree on top, so that uh, the top of the root ball is slightly above the ground. Add mix to the sides, pack it down lightly. Do not spray water or other products directly on fig leaves. If you've got to spray a product to treat your fig tree, do it early in the morning or in the evening. Uh, that's any product. You don't want to uh, bake a leaf in the sun. The fi uh, figs, they need the leaves. Prune your in-ground fig tree annually. Keep it at a reasonable height, so don't let it get all the way up there. Prune it so where you can get the fruit. Uh, if you can't get the fruit, it's useless to you. Oh, look at my fig tree. It's two stories tall. That's great. Try and get a fig off of it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's useless. You've got to prune them when they're asleep. So that's uh, dead winter. So like I see this is green right here. It's not the best cutting. This will root, but it's not the best material. So this should, you can see it started to lignify. That means it started turning brown there and started to harden off. But it's, it's that's it. We stopped the process. So now you got to root it or throw it away. Um, you don't want that. If you want to really, if you're really concerned about the health, wrap the tr fig tree the way it is. Uh, early, early spring, when there's no more fear of a hard frost, unwrap it and you can prune it. You can prune it before you wrap it, that's fine also, you know what I mean, you're not going to kill it. But um, the best thing for the health of the tree is to prune it while it's dead asleep. So we're talking about potted trees, so you, get, you buy a fig tree in a one gallon pot, um, the, the, it'll start eventually get root bound in there if you leave it and don't go from a one gallon to can't do it. It won't give you figs. Uh, you go from one gallon to a two gallon, then to a maybe a five gallon. You got to let it grow into that pot. Um, if you don't, it's going to, it's still, it's going to be alive, but it's going to do what a fig tree does and it's going to put roots down. If it has fresh soil it wants to put roots in, well, that's what it's going to do. It's not going to put uh, figs on for you. 10, 10 is the most. It's easy to move around, gives you plenty of figs. You can get a trunk that big, you can get a monster tree in a 10 gallon pot. Winterizing. So if you got any winterizing questions, <laughs> I guess we come up with them now. So I'll tell you the basic thing, rule of thumb, is don't put plastic on the branches. You can't have pl plastic touching the branches. Um, it'll freeze the branches and kill whatever, whatever it's touching. Burlap first, then you can put plastic on, and then a uh, bucket on the top. It's the easiest thing to do. Or you could do, um, I use the pink insulation and I, I keep reusing it. So I throw it in the shed and uh, I keep, I wrap it around the following year and maybe I got to buy another roll because the fig tree is bigger and I'll tie that on and then I'll put tar paper, five gallon bucket on top. Um, hey, uh, you were telling me, Joel was telling me about hay. 
Hay is good. It's a great, great insulator. Uh, the problem with hay is that it'll uh, attract uh, some small animals to live in there, which is fine. They, they need some way to live in the winter, um, but they may eat the bark. So you don't want them to girdle your fig tree and kill it. Um, so what you do is if you use hay, you're going to put hay and then put tar paper on the outside. Just pile up some dirt around the bottom uh, of the, where the tar paper meets the ground. Keep out the animals. Best way, if you want to have it in ground, you can have a fig tree here in ground if you dig it out half the root ball every year, dig a little coffin for it, prune it, and lay it down in the ground. Plywood, leaves, whatever, mulch, whatever, grass clippings, whatever you got, just throw on top to insulate it. Put a garbage pail or a brick on top so it stays down. Pick it up in the, in the spring and you're done. It's, fine. it's the best way. Your fig tree will come back. You won't lose a branch here. It's a lot of work. If I'm the tree right here, you're only breaking around here. Not this side, only here. You're digging out and then you're digging a little coffin and then you're laying it down right into that. Even by wrapping, you're still, your odds are a lot better, but you're still rolling the dice. That I've just learned, I've, a lot of fig trees have died and gotten, have gotten damaged and, um, you know, I've done incredible wrap jobs. Um, I've planted fig trees up in uh, upstate, in, we're in 4B up there, where no fig tree in the world, in, it should be living anywhere in the world in 4B. And I got a fig tree to live for three years in the ground up there. I couldn't believe it. And I was just simple, put a garbage pail over it, filled it with hay, put some bricks in it first, filled it with hay, cover on a garbage pail, and that's it. I got it to live for three years like that. And I thought I had it. I thought I was the bee's knees and got cold one time and killed it right down the ground. I know somebody that actually digs the whole tree up and has a huge pit on their property, and they throw all their fig trees in. It's a big family thing every year. They come, they dig the, the trees up, everybody brings a dish, they have a big day, and uh, that's the day they bury all the fig trees, and they throw all the crap on top of it, and that's it. The next following season, they go dig them up, put one in each hole, they even move them around. Oh, let's put this one here now, put that one there, and it works. That's the best way. That's the best way to do it. Or you gotta move to a warmer climate. That's it. So watering an in-ground tree, uh, you gotta water it lightly every two or three days after planting. And once the roots take hold and the buds in your tree start to swell, uh, you'll notice new growth. You can water every day or every other day. Um, don't drown it. There's a new tree. Don't drown it. Once it's established in the ground, there's much, much less of a tra uh, chance of killing it. Roots of in-ground fig trees are greedy, and once they take hold, they'll find the water. So. Uh, in the Mediterranean area, even outside going into the Middle East, it gets very, very dry. Fig trees could take it. They could take a lot of dryness. Fig tree in there. There's no leaves on it, but it's alive. I grew it in that bag and I just, I saved it like this. I just wanted to show you guys. There's, no, there's nothing in there. There's virtually no, no moisture in there at all. And they're just able to, to, to survive like that. Especially in ground. You don't have to worry about watering too much in ground. When you're growing in pots, it's imperative that you get on a watering schedule. And again, your trees will tell you. Potted fig trees. And it's got to be in the full sun. You have a little more uh, leverage. You can move the pot around and uh, so it stays in the sun. Six to eight hours of sun a day. More sun equals more watering, but you'll get healthier yields of figs and tastier figs. Uh, so you got to use a well-draining pot that's large enough for the tree, but easy enough for you to maneuver. So that's why we're getting into this, uh, you know, uh, I grow my tree in a wine barrel that, you know, grandpa had and uh, throw it in the garbage, man. You don't need that. It's too big. You can't move it around. You know, you want to keep, you want to be able to move your fig tree around and give it the care that it needs. Ten gallons is, is really all you need. Pot should have enough holes on the bottom. So, I mean, any, any plastic nursery pot that you buy is going to have holes in it. If you don't think it has enough holes, drill more holes in it. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It, it, you can't have enough holes in a pot when it comes to a fig tree. Put them in the side, put more in the bottom, wherever. Don't ever put a saucer under the pot. So you put the pot down, don't put anything that you can't put it anywhere where it's going to collect water. If that bottom of that pot collects water, it'll drown the roots. And that's the one thing with, with uh, potted uh, fig trees is that you really have to control the watering. When you pot it, 
put a layer of pine bark chips on the bottom of the pot, age with drainage, just in case you do get that influx of water, it'll stay around those, those chips on the bottom of the pot. And then use a good quality potting mix um, when transplanting or root pruning. So they like, figs like a uh, light mix. Go to the store, get a bag of potting mix. Potting mix, not garden soil or anything else. Potting mix only. And then get yourself a bag of perlite and mix the two, uh, maybe at a ratio, I don't know if I put it in there, but uh, maybe at a ratio of three to one, three parts potty mix to one part perlite. You wanna make that mix light, airy, for the roots to be able to, to grow and um, in, into those little cracks and crevices. Um, another reason for that is it, those little cracks and crevices hold the moisture for the, uh, for the tree. Uh, you want it, they hold the moisture, but they also hold air. So that's very important because if you don't have air, if you have a heavy mix, it kills the roots. Um, so it may not kill the tree, but the tree won't perform like you want it to. So you want these trees to produce for you. You want them to give you figs, and so you want to give it the best that you can give it. I water, I, I wait now until when it, it gets really hot and I think I rarely water twice a day, rarely. I'm usually, I'm usually when it gets into the, to the height of the summer, I'm um, one, once a day. If you put your finger into the pot and it's moist, you can feel some moisture on your skin, you're good. That's it, you're fine. And of course, don't put them in the path of a lawn sprinkler and uh, don't spray anything directly on the leaves. Transplant and root prune every two to three years. It's very important. Um, when, you're in, when you grow in a pot, I guess that's the biggest uh, issue when it comes to growing in a pot, is root pruning. So, I mean, we'll say I, I do mine pretty much uh, like every two years. Uh, every three years, maybe even you can stretch it out to four once you get into a bigger pot. Uh, easy to root prune. I, I have some pictures on here. Uh, a reciprocating saw, cordless, pull it out of the pot, right on the ground, cut it into a square. Cut the root ball into a square. Cut a few inches off the bottom, put some soil in the new pot, put it in, new soil around it, you're done. It really takes a couple of minutes. It's easy to do. Once you do that, that year, the figs that that tree will give you, poof, forget it. <laughs> Birds, of course, the control methods, uh, bird netting, predator decoys, owls. I use rubber snakes. They work very well. Walk through the, the orchard every day, just take a snake, put it over here, move it around like they're moving around. They, believe it or not, they work very well, but you got to get it. If you're going to use uh, any kind of predator decoys, you got to start it early, before you put the figs out or before you unwrap. Get those birds on that schedule right away that they know, oh, there's an owl there, there's a snake there, and then move it around. Pie tins, CDs, flash tape, all these, all these, whatever these little tricks that you've ever heard about using to get rid of birds, they all work, but they don't work for a long time. Disney is doing this. They're running fishing line over uh, certain portions of wherever they want to protect from birds in uh, not even in a crisscross pattern, but uh, spaced, I, mean, I think they said 18 inches apart. Squirrels are another problem. Squirrels are thieving. Ugh. They, I'm telling you, they wait and they are smart, man. They got, I got some pictures of some animals here, I'll show you, but all alive. Um, put organza bags, you know those things you get in a wedding, the, the, the candies in them? I cover all my figs. I have hundreds of them throughout the, the season. Uh, they work to an extent until they learn the figs are in the bags and then they just take the bag. <laughs> so I'm not joking you, this is what they do. Uh, when you do see a colony of ants around figs, you want to get rid of them. Um, they do carry other pests and diseases, so you want to take care of them right away. Fortunately, that's the easiest thing to take care of. Uh, a pot of boiling water, you can get rid of a whole colony instantly. Um, borax, you know, the old, what was it, the Mule Team 7, is that the name of it? Uh, mixed with uh, some peanut butter and jelly. You gotta use both for sugar ants and protein ants. Put it in a little container and they take that back to the colony, three days you'll be gone. As long as your trees are not touching like a fence or anything like that, Tanglefoot wraps around the trunk. If you're growing in a single, uh, a single trunk, a uh, single stalk, work great. Grafting is, um, right now, it's getting more popular in figs. It never used to be as popular as it is now. 
Grafting will take three years off of the wait time to get a fig. So uh, it's great to learn how to graft. It's easy to do. Fig trees, easy. I still have my original, my first graft on a fig tree, I still got it. Fig rust is not really that big of a deal for us here. It's more in the humid areas. Uh, fig rust does appear here, there, though. And when it comes, it runs through your fig collection fast, very fast, like wildfire. By the time you realize you have it, it's too late. It's too late for any treatments, and I'm not a big uh, fan of, of the treatments either. Uh, so you pretty much got to call it a day. The best thing you could do at that point is keep everything clean. Pick up all the, because it is a, uh, a, a fungus. So first thing you'll notice is you'll say, wow, what are those spots on the leaves? And you won't even think twice about it. And then a day will go by and you'll start to see this. Um, and it goes through, when I tell you fast, man, I lost an entire collection once because of fig rust. Can be deadly. It's, it, is, um, it is treatable. Like I said, I don't like the treatments. They are very harsh. I think there's something called the Bordeaux treatment for it. Mm. I mean, I'll try, if I get a couple of trees, I'll soak it down with neem oil. I spray neem oil on everything. Neem oil is great. Fortunately, it happens in the latter part of the season. So uh, if they do defoliate, it, doesn't, it won't affect your fruit. You'll be all right. Um, but, you know, of course, you still want to ripen figs, and you need the, 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 the leaves to uh, create sugars to, you know, the whole process. So um, if you do see it, try the best you can to treat it with, uh, I'm going to say neem. I'm not going to go anything harder than that, neem oil. to a dormant oil, and uh, if you can't, if it doesn't work with that, just pick up the mess, clean up the mess every day, and that's it. Cold season. It'll be gone the following year. The, the cold will kill it. Fig mosaic virus. So I'm not going to get into all, all this, what it is, but uh, as far as fig mosaic virus goes, I think that every fig tree has it. That's my belief. Um, fig mosaic virus is a uh, crippling disease for a fig tree, but it is not a death sentence. Um, fig mosaic virus shows, it appears, when the health of a fig tree is declining. So if you see, you start seeing mottled leaves, misshapen leaves, uh, misshapen terminal branches, uh, a branch that's growing beautiful, all of a sudden it just goes off onto a weird angle, and fig mosaic virus. Like I said, every fig tree has it. I don't care what anybody says. So I use it as an indicator. When I see it up here, especially on one particular tree, I'm like, all right, something's going on. You got to start figuring out. You got to start pulling out, you know, and check the soil. Is it too wet? Is it, all right, it's too wet, then now you know it's not, the water, is, it's not taking up water. So why is it not doing that? Is it getting too much? Is, uh, you know, is, is there something wrong with the, the uh, fertilizing schedule? There's a million things. If it's just a couple of leaves, cut them off, call it a day, fertilize, fertilize, fertilize. That's a great way to help get rid of it. Neem oil, I know guys that have had a lot of success really soaking the tree down with neem oil. Again, not during the day, early morning or in the evening. Just going back to rust for one second. So rust will also show, if you're growing, I grow in close quarters there, you can see it's um, very tight. I'm one fig tree right next to the other. That does not help. So to help stave off the rust, air's gotta f circulate. Uh, around the leaves. These are big, broad leaves, these, these fig leaves, and um, if you bunch them all up together, some funky things happen sometimes. So you gotta, you gotta let the air circulate around these, around these trees. The happy critters that attack me all the time that, um, look at this guy, I, I am not, look at that, ready to bite, biting into that fig, look at him. Oh, it drives me nuts. This, <laughs> this guy, I got a video, I wish I could put it on here, this guy climbed up this branch right here to the end of that branch. I couldn't believe it. I got a video of it, of him reaching like this for a fig. I couldn't believe it. Gopher, or groundhog, whatever you call it. And there's uh, Robbie the raccoon over there. But um, I mean, there's nothing you could do. Listen, we, we live in a, in a semi-rural area. You, even if you have one tree, they're gonna find it. The big problems now that's coming is these, if you live in an area where the deer are, so down in Tottenville where I am, now the deer are walking up the street. I am not kidding you, it's unbelievable. And uh, it's only a matter of time before they find the yard. Turkeys too. So the turkeys are making their way down the block. And uh, 
Yeah, they'll be in the yard soon. The last stinky bug is uh, spotted wing drosophilia. And this is uh, an Asian bug. It, was, it, it came in here. Very, very damaging to fig trees. All thin-skinned fruit, but fig trees in particular. Um, so what can you do about it? Nothing. I'm going to tell you, I've tried everything for spotted wing drosophilia. Some people don't get it. If you're growing a couple of trees, you won't get it. Some people, it just won't affect them. Um, I get it all the time. And I use, I, I don't want to spray any chemicals. I've tried the chemicals just to see what it would do. They work. I'm not, I'm not spraying them on my fig trees. I'm not doing it. So the birds will come, peck the fig or eat the fig. That's when they show up. What works is uh, you have to go out there every single day, pick a bird damaged fruit, pick up any fruit that's fallen on the ground, clean up the leaves, you know, always make sure the tops of the pots are clean, and that's the only thing that, that is really the best. Keeping the birds away is the best remedy for spotted wing drosophilia. Prune your tree when it's do uh, dormant. Of course, you're gonna out, start out with um, a sharp pair of pruners, clean, clean it with some bleach and water. Start from the bottom and work your way to the top. Um, terminate prune branches at a 45 degree angle. So you're gonna take off dying, dead, and weak branches. That's your first order of business. So anything that's dying is already dead or looks a little, ah, that's not gonna make it, get rid of it. It's not gonna, a dead branch is not gonna grow for you, so get rid of it, you don't need it. Next thing you're gonna do is prune any branches that are growing downward or inward crossing one another. So if you're growing out like a vase like this and you got a branch coming across like that, it's not gonna do you any good. When that branch gets bigger and grows leaves, it's gonna block out the sun from other fruit. Get rid of it. You want everything to grow outward and open like a vase. Plus you wanna keep the height manageable so you can pick your fruit um, and thin the center like a vase. Okay, so pruning can remove an entire crop of figs. So I said we get two crops of figs. Um, the first crop grows on last year's branches. So last year's branch, this year will produce the first crop of fig. The main crop produces on new growth. So a new gr branch will grow from nothing and that will grow figs on it, that's your main crop. So if you prune off all of last year's branches, you won't have a first crop. But not, it's not particularly bad for us here. I'll tell you why. Uh, for us, the varieties that we grow here in the Northeast, the first crop is not as prolific as the main crop. So it doesn't matter. I'm willing to sacrifice my first crop, and I think, I, I, I think it's like up to 40% of my first crop, maybe even more. I, I, it doesn't even matter, I don't care if it all goes. I'm pruning for my main crop of figs. So branches that cross over, right here, see that? Crossing, growing inward and crossing over, sever that right there. You won't get this kind of suckering, but you will get this. So these you could dig up. You could dig up and make new fig trees out of these. So you can, might wanna leave those to later on in the spring. You can just dig them up, pull them out, do a little surgery on that, and you'll have three new fig trees. Depending on how you want to grow, again, you may want to leave a scaffold. That's a really, for me, that would be a short uh, trunk. I would want to extend that up to here. That looks like it would be about here. I would want that starting about here and maybe here and then have my, start my scaffolds. And uh, basically, I think I would want to get to uh, three scaffold branches up there spaced evenly apart and uh, on a fig tree, that's pretty easy to do. If it's not spaced evenly apart, cut it off and wait till the following year. Um, and then each one, each one of those branches, you want another three branches, and so on and so on. Pruning this way, eventually, you're not going to have any more branches for fruit. So it's got to get bigger. You you're going to have to let it get bigger or cut those branches off and grow new ones. So you get your reciprocating saw. That's what it looks like coming out of the pot. Cut off a, a slice right there. You can see how, how the roots, how thick they are in here. And then you cut that into a little cube, put it back in a pot with some fresh soil, and that's it, and you're good to go. It really takes a couple of minutes to do each one. Propagating is uh, low cost, and it really is a, a great way to uh, expand your collection and uh, make gifts for friends and family. 
and it's something you could do anywhere in your house, kitchen table, dining room, and basement. And um, so the different methods of propagation, we're concerned with the top one, cuttings. And I'm going to show you what air layering looks like, too, because that's pretty fun. It's uh, very easy to do. It's another, thing, uh, another method of making a brand new tree right on the tree. You could bend a low branch into the ground, put some soil on it, put a brick on top of it, give it a couple of months, and you'll grow a new, new tree from that. Just take the brick off, sever it, and, and replant it in a, in a pot. Air layering consists of you get a, a vessel put it around a branch, put some uh, growing medium inside of it, and cover it with some tin foil. In about a week or so, that's what you get. You start getting some roots appearing. And in about 30 days, that's what it looks like. You get that root ball. You sever it from the tree, you pot it up, and there you go. Propagate by cuttings. What, so what do you need? So you need um, these baggies. You need your cuttings, rubber band, and some soil. So you want to fill up this bag kind of up to here with soil. And one scoop with this is what does it. So uh, usually if you want to you can use a garden shovel or a little uh, scoop, whatever you want. It's a pain in the neck to get it in here. So you just fill up your, your soil in the tube right up to the top there. Put the top in the bag let it slide in. So you're ready to go. You got a, a growing vessel there and, it's, and uh, you know, let's take a, yeah, here's one that's semi lignified You want to get your clippers and uh, you want to give it a fresh cut on both sides. So the top, 45 degree angle and 45 because you want to know which side is the top. You can lose track very easily what's up and what's down on a fig and oftentimes uh, they'll get planted upside down. They'll still grow, but they, you know, it'll take a little bit longer. So 45 at the top, so you know which is the top. And give it another snip at the bottom, close. So you want to kind of leave maybe a quarter of an inch, three-eighths of an inch from that last node right there, right? Then you want to take this blade and give the uh, node a scrape right over it. And what you want to do is you want to just get to that green cambium layer down there. So, but what you're doing is this is where all the hormones are stored, right over here, right in, this, in, in these uh, nodes. So you want to do it on both sides. See the, the green is showing? And you're almost done. You just take it. If you want to use rooting home, hormone at this, at this point, you can. I don't use it. I feel it adds no value. But uh, if you want, you can. Right in the middle, put it down. Get yourself a rubber band. We're gonna get, we'll get it through. I should have brought the water up first, but. You could take a piece of tape and just seal that over on the top there. Keep it somewhere warm. So you wanna be at like uh, 78, 78 degrees, let's say. Um, if you do enough to put into a little box, keep them on top of a water heater in the basement. Uh, I, got, I have heat mats. Um, they're easy to control. Um, you can put them in a, in a plastic container. You can even keep them in a box, and uh, they're fine. Start to get growth, and you can't see the roots in here because it's been in here for so long, but um, I'm going to cycle through those pictures. So this, um, the growing medium I use is called ProMix BX. Um, I found it's a good mix. It's uh, very light, right out of the bag, light and airy. You don't have to add anything to it. Uh, you want to add enough water to the mix so that you get, when you clump it like that, it should actually be, there should be a little bit more, but it should just clump up a little bit, and that's it. It can't be wet. You don't want it, want this, this mixture wet. You're not watering these things when they're in that bag. You could also use uh, a miracle Grow product. You could use any potting mix, and again, add some pearl, just add some perlite into it. Make it a little more airy. That's it. Start to see uh, roots develop. A little, you know, leaves or a branch will come out of the nodes, and um, when this starts to to dry up a little bit, and it has roots and top growth, so you want roots and top growth, it's ready. Yeah. So then at that point, this uh, the soil will be more compact. It'll be easy to easy to work with. So it should not fall away. And you, what you do, you'll do is just cut this away, and you'll 
start from the top here, right at the seam, and just rip the bag open. You want to be careful not to hurt the roots, um, but the, the soil will stay in one piece, should stay in one piece, with the roots intact, and then you very carefully put it in a pot, soil around it, don't compact it down, and that's it. I root during the winter. Uh, a lot of people hate root, do, rooting during the winter. Um, you know, it's a little tough. You got to deal with heat mats and stuff like that, you know, instead of keeping them outside. But it's the winter. All my other trees are asleep and, you know, it gives me something to do. Um, so I, when I root, I'll do, I'll, I'll do a couple hundred at a time. And uh, the success ratio would probably uh, 75% right now, which is pretty good. So when it starts to develop roots, when you start seeing those roots, uh, take a toothpick, put like three holes on each side of the bag. So six holes all together, just to start getting some air in there. That's enough, don't go crazy poking around. You know, as a matter of fact, start with two holes. The least amount of holes, the better. You, you want it to develop in there with whatever moisture is in there. You don't want that moisture to escape. I'm putting uh, turkey syringes in them things and filling them with water and fertilizer. And I, I get a little crazy with it sometimes, I do. But that's only because I'm growing um, on heat mats and I'm, I'm a, I have a sp specific objective. If you're just doing a couple of them, a dozen, 20, maybe even a few more, put them on top of your, your uh, what do you call it, uh, water heater in the basement, that's fine. Top of the refrigerator, great spot. Um, put them in the closet too, be fine, dark closet in a, in a container. It'll be, as long as the temperature is, is uh, constant. You know, even if it's like 75, it'll be fine. It'll take a little bit longer, that's all. Typical, uh, I'll fill up all my baggies first, and then I'll, I'll do a tray like that. And I, I can't remember, I think 36 I could fit in there uh, at a clip. And that's what you'll get. So that's what you'll see, that root right there. Don't put holes in the bag when you see that. That's, that's the first root. Um, but this is what they turn into. So this is done. So if you got top growth like this, with roots like any of those, that's it. It's done cooking. Open it up, put it in a pot, and off to the races. So you can see how scraggly they all look down there. Those are newly potted cuttings down there. If you're going to do anything online with figs, I would suggest going on that Facebook group, Rough Edge Fig Group, and also um, ourfigs.com. Great, great resource. And when I tell you anything to do about figs, it's like a giant encyclopedia having to do with figs. If anybody, uh, I guess I know I keep bringing it up, but if, you, if anybody has a fig tree that they grew up with that they want to try and get, I would suggest going on Google Earth, drill down on the house and see if, if it's still there in the backyard. Look in neighbor's yards, talk to relatives. Um, there's a lot of different ways. You never know until you ask. You really never know who's got, you know, oh, Uncle Nicky had a piece of that fig tree from, you know, whatever. But Uncle Nicky don't have it anymore, but he gave it to his neighbor who lives in Connecticut now. And, it, it, that's how it works. Everybody's got a piece of these fig trees, everybody. So a little detective work, you can get it back. And when I tell you it's worth it, man, when you get that fig tree and if you eat that first fig off of that tree that you ate when you were a kid or that you even remember when you were a kid, it's fantastic. It's a great feeling, it really is.